Hi, I'm Indiana Attorney General Greg Zeller. I also serve as the co-chair of our state's Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Task Force. Each day, 46 people die from an overdose of prescription painkillers in the United States. This is the biggest man-made epidemic of our time. Unfortunately, prescription drug abuse often leads to heroin use, an even more deadly addiction. Last year, I supported a new law that encourages first responders to carry naloxone, a life-saving treatment that counteracts the effects of prescription painkiller or heroin overdose. The new law provides immunity for law enforcement, firefighters, and EMTs who administer naloxone to overdose victims. I'm grateful to law enforcement agencies across the state who've saved many lives by implementing naloxone programs. Follow their lead. Take advantage of available resources to assist law enforcement in creating naloxone programs. Thank you for joining us in this effort to help save more Hoosier lives. So a target respiratory rate for adults is 18 per minute, roughly. So when a person has consumed an opioid product, uh, they, their respiratory rate starts to decrease. They're maybe four times per minute or two times per minute, or maybe they've stopped breathing altogether. They're not getting a good oxygen exchange in their body. When they're not getting fresh oxygen into the body and it's not being circulated appropriately, they start to uh, kill tissue. The body has got to have oxygen to function well. So they start to lose brain tissue. Uh, uh, ultimately, you can only go a very few minutes without exchanging oxygen before that person is gonna wind up in a cardiac arrest state. Um, and that's the point where their heart stops and their pulse stops. Our goal is to get to them before that with Narcan or Naloxone. In the clinical setting or in emergency medical services with paramedics, we inject this intravenously. It can also be administered intranasally or it can be administered as an intramuscular injection into the upper arm or into the middle thigh. When Narcan or Naloxone gets into the system, it looks for the, the opioid and the receptor and it effectively knocks the opioid off of the receptor. This allows the individual that's affected to begin to regain uh, their respiratory rate, to begin to circulate oxygen and come back around. And what we'll see in these patients is that the uh, sometimes they may have kind of a bluish tinge to them. That's from the lack of oxygen or the hypoxia. That will start to go away and we'll look for what we call pinking up. They'll start to regain their color a little bit. Uh, they will also begin to open their eyes and come around uh, and be able to uh, start to put together where they are and what's going on. They may not be fully alert and aware, and that's something to be very cautious for. You may have to introduce yourself several times and, and let them know where they're at and what's going on. There is a risk of aggressive behavior uh, or aspiration anytime this is administered, but we're seeing so much less of that now compared to what we used to see, and that's based on appropriate dosing uh, and learning over time how much they need. Uh, there is possibility that they need two doses uh, prior to EMS arrival or prior to transport to a hospital, and that's acceptable if they're not coming around after the first dose and you suspect an opioid overdose, it's okay to give a second dose. The medication, uh, it does have an expense, but it does not do any harm if it's administered and there is not an opioid overdose. Narcan or naloxone is something that we have used for decades in emergency medical services in the field since the 60s and 70s. The side effects are relatively minimal in comparison with what you're dealing with. Uh, personally, I've never seen a patient have a, an allergic or adverse reaction. There is potential for allergic or adverse reaction with any type of medication, uh, but we have to weigh risk versus benefit. If they have no known allergy to the medication and you suspect an opioid overdose, this is the one thing that will stop that overdose uh, and, and begin to turn them around and bring them back.
It may not be a needle or a spoon or a pipe that you see at the scene. It may not be the traditional thing we think of when we talk about overdose. Uh, we're talking about opioids and things that fall in the opioid family. So that includes prescription pain medications uh, and not necessarily an intentional overdose or abuse, but maybe an accidental overdose or abuse. Uh, things you're looking for in these prescription bottles or packages would be names like fentanyl, uh, Vicodin, Duragesic, Oxycontin, Hydromorphone, Morphine. These are things that we typically see that are prescribed as pain medications. Uh, while there is potential for abuse, there's also potential for accidental use. Once you've identified that, the, that you uh, have a patient that you suspect has an opioid overdose, the next thing you want to do is take your Narcan or Naloxone, uh, the pre-filled syringe, open the package, Make sure your medication is in date and has not expired. Assemble the syringe by putting the glass tube against the, uh, the opening and turn, just as is indicated on the package. At that point, you remove the cap from the top of the syringe and apply the mucosal atomizer device, or the MAD, as we call it. Once you have that all secured, you want to bring the syringe up to the patient's nair and inject about half of the uh, Narcan or Naloxone into the nair and put the other half, the other one milliliter, up the other side. Uh, it does require a forceful push, and that's a forceful push of the syringe not a forceful push against the nose. You do want to make sure the mucosal atomizer device or, or MAD has a good seat at the nair uh, and a good seal around it, but you don't necessarily need to push against the nose. The reason you want to push with force is so that you get that atomized mist rather than a trickling of liquid down the back of the nose uh, and into the upper airway. Once you've done that, you want to secure the syringe Put that away, there should not be any needles present. And then we recommend turning the patient up on their left side. Uh, if the only way to move them is to their right side, that's fine. But the goal or the point is to get them on their side and keep them there. That way, if there's any chance that there's vomitus or aspirate, that's gonna flow out through gravity and not block the airway. So moving them up on their side. Narcan or naloxone, after this is administered, we want to ensure the patient is transported to a receiving facility, to an emergency room by EMS. Uh, that way we make sure that they are completely past this event and this moment. They're evaluated by a physician and we know that there's no chance of immediate uh, recurrence or that they uh, overdose again. We want to make sure that we've given the most effective treatment possible and that we've gotten them past this point. It is critical that they're transported to higher medical uh, authority. I really didn't have an opinion of it beforehand. I mean, I, it was just to me, it was just a medical thing and that the uh, medics would, would, it was part of their tools, not part of ours. A medic would always come with us and it would tell us that the medics were also en route. Well, once we got there, most of the time we beat the medics there, even if it's by a couple minutes. You know, time matters, and you might have that one to two minutes extra that saved somebody and got to them. I mean, if it was a DOA, that would take hours. Doing an Narcan report takes 10 minutes. The first time I did it um, was on a 50-year-old male. There was people that were flagging me into the women's restroom, and she was in the handicap stall, and... She was unresponsive, laying on the ground. I'm trying to get directions to the ambulance, and some of those alleyways are narrow. Like you said, you know, response times, we can fit down alleys a little easier than ambulances can. I administered Narcan um, through her nose, and she came to... Administer the Narcan to him and getting him awake, and was able to get him awake, and you know, the medics got to him and transported him. When most people go through the interview process to be a police officer, um, they always say, because I want to help people. Our job out here is to protect people and save lives when we can, and that's your job. So why wouldn't you carry something that can directly help someone immediately? I mean, I think that's where you're going to find the liability at. If somebody finds that you had the medicine to save somebody and the guy dies and you didn't administer, I think you're on the hook for that one. 
I was kind of on the fence with it because a lot of people automatically think, how can I avoid a lawsuit? How can I, they thought, you know, all these terrible things. You get in that police car every day. Every day there's a liability. You're driving the car, if you hit somebody, if you excessive force, there's all kinds of liability. So if you're worried about anarchy and it's just goes with the territory. If you don't want to and you're giving excuses about why you don't use it, I kind of just think it's because you're lazy. I mean, it's a tool, it's just a, it's like part of my first aid kit. It's something extra I have, hey, I have it, I can use it. It's no worse than somebody being shot, you're gonna go put a, you know, try to stop the bleeding. I think my opinion has changed just because uh, before I maybe didn't have an opinion and now um, I feel like it's more good than bad. I don't think my perspective has really changed. I think it's just, like I said, it's added something else to my first aid kit where, hey, I don't feel, I don't want to say helpless like in years past. When I go to, to a run now and I have it, um, I don't feel helpless. It wasn't like the movies. I thought the guy was just going to spring up and just jump up, you know. And so I, I, I just actually stood back after I administered it and gave him the rub to see what he was going to do. But he didn't. It just like he was just waking up from a deep sleep. And uh, With myself administering it and with the medics administering it, I've never seen anybody wake up and be violent. I don't know. I guess if they, we come across that and you just kind of deal with that, that's going to be part of it. <laughs> I mean, it's part of your job to help people. I think the, the real thing here is you have the opportunity to save somebody's life and you're right there. So.